This is an extract from the Leader Coronavirus Daily podcast by the Evening Standard and hosted by me, David Marsland. To hear the whole thing, search for it on your podcast provider. Under microscopes in labs all over the world, scientists study COVID-19. They're looking for weaknesses, but it's a tough bug to crack. A vaccine could be years away if it comes at all. There is, though, another route, the human body itself. Why do some people suffer more than others, and how can that be used against the virus? Teams of doctors from all over the UK are now working together on a massive project to map the genomes of up to 35,000 people with coronavirus. Ideally, they want every patient who has been treated in intensive care to work with them. I'm joined now by Professor Sir Mark Caulfield, who's the Chief Scientist at Genomics England. Mark, can we start with why COVID-19 itself is proving so hard to beat? So this is a complex viral infection and um, people respond differently to it. So for some people, it's possible to have this and be asymptomatic. For others, they seem to have a more challenging course with this infection. And so that makes it a bit more challenging to understand how we combat it. Uh, And there is considerable focus now on seeking a vaccine um, and a candidate or two have entered trials. It does seem to have this massive difference between how people experience the virus. Now, clearly, that's what it is that you're looking at. But are there any working theories right now as to why this could be? Well, there are a number of potential theories. One is the load of the virus we're exposed to. So if you get a bigger viral load, maybe you could have a more severe infection. Another potential reason is our own genetic makeup. Because within our genome, we know that some of us are, um, have um, variation that cre- creates risk that we will um, actually respond adversely when faced by an infectious disease. Now, it might be that we could live through our entire lives without any problem if we'd never come across the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So uh, I think that it is a mixture of how well we are, possibly some genetic factors, and then the particular strain of virus that we get, and there are different strains in circulation. And that's why we're really focused on trying to understand what factors in your and my genome may contribute to the severity of response. So this is a very big question. It's very complicated. The work that you're doing is very complicated. Could you try to explain what it is exactly that you're doing as simply as possible, please? Our proposition is to read the entire genetic code of 20,000 severely affected individuals and compare those with 15,000 very mildly or asymptomatic individuals. That comparison of an extreme response at either end of the spectrum will hopefully allow us to define the changes in your and my genome that alter the course of the disease. So why do some people end in the ITU and some sadly perish, but for others, it's not a big problem at all. And ideally, you're looking to work with everyone who's been through ICU with this, aren't you? Yes, we are indeed. And we are actively enrolling people in the intensive care unit today and have been for a few weeks now. But we would really love to hear from people who've been in ICU, who've had a severe illness and recovered and there is a method to volunteer uh, on Genomics England's website. So Genomics England and COVID will get you to a page where you can register your interest to be involved. Equally so, if people have tested positive for COVID, yet they've had no symptoms or a very mild course and were really surprised to discover they'd had the virus, then they can also register through that mechanism. And We need to represent the richly diverse communities we have across the entire UK. That's why it's UK wide, but particularly we want to hear from people who've had severe or mild infection who come from minority communities that are often underrepresented in similar programmes. Is there a link between ethnicity and COVID-19? So there is some data that suggests that uh, both from the United States and France and now from the UK, that there is an excess of adverse outcomes amongst minority communities. We do not yet know whether that reflects 
the fact that some of those communities have tended in our society to be in more deprived areas, but there are striking differentials that have been seen in the New York uh, element of this pandemic, and also uh, my colleagues in France comment on it. So we need to understand that, and we need to protect those communities uh, as well as all facets of our society against this in the second and third wave. So your work here could potentially come up with new treatments, but the one thing that I know people want to know about, and the one thing I know that scientists' hearts kind of fall when they hear it, is how long is this going to take? I think that's that's really hard. My heart hasn't fallen, but it's really hard to answer that question, honestly. I would have to say I don't know. I think we can expect a second wave. I think when we unlock a bit, we will see an increase in infection again. What we need to do is to be able to manage that, to be able to look after those who are most severely affected. I also think that vaccines can take quite a long time to develop. Um, I suspect we'll probably not have a vaccine till maybe this time next year, uh, and, and that's if we're lucky. There are early vaccines in trial, but it's not simply about whether the vaccine appears to work on its first exposure. It's whether we can manufacture it with the quality we need to be able to safely deliver it to millions of people. Why do you expect there'll be a second wave? It, typically, the natural history of these infections is that there's a primary wave and then there's a secondary wave. If you go back to the so-called Spanish flu, the pandemic of 1918, in which my uh, great-grandparents died in New York and orphaned their children who had to return to Ireland. The first wave was bad, but the second wave was worse. The reason that the second waves come, and it may not be continuous, is that some viruses don't like ultraviolet light, and in the Northern Hemisphere, we're experiencing a bit more ultraviolet light and sunshine, and so they don't do well in that setting. So we have to anticipate the, that this will happen. It really depends on the next few weeks and how we manage this. And we know that when you lift lockdown, there's going to be more cases because we can see that in Singapore and we can see it in Germany. And it will be true in the United States. In a week or 10 days time, they will have an uptick. And this is what the government are doing here is they're uh, r relaxing things to in a calculated way to try and minimize the number of people but allow essential people to go back and get the economy kick-started. Just to clarify, a week, or, uh, a week or 10 days, was that, were you referring to the UK or US there? I, I was thinking that you, uh, if you look at other countries, about a week after they've been, or 10 days after they relax measures, they start to see some increase in the infection. It's true in Germany. We haven't, obviously, the US has just really released lockdown. So, so I would suggest probably a week, 10 days, we might see an uptick in Britain, obviously today being the way for a structured return to work. But I think what the government are doing, which is right, is they're trying to balance the risks of this with the needs of the total population of the country. Uh, that's a tough balance, but um, I think they're doing the right things. Search for the leader Coronavirus Daily on any podcast provider to hear more from the podcast.